we're on, we're on the move here in our church. A lot of great things are happening, improving our building, uh, meeting the needs of the community, uh, connecting with city officials. I, I really believe that the best is yet to come. God really wants to use our life. How many feel like God wants to use your life? He really does. And coming back from Yosemite, I was so excited to know that they finally actually finished uh, the book that I wrote. And I'm excited to announce that I've written a book. It's called Rise Up Now. And it will be released nationally. That means all over the country. It's going to be released in Barnes and Nobles and on Amazon on October 15th. Amen. And I wrote this book because after 25 years of working with young leaders, I really felt that it was time to put something down on paper. I had been encouraged for years by my family members to write. They feel like that's a gift God's given me. I, I feel it's a gift God's given me. How many know that we should use the gifts God gives us? And he's given us that gift and I've received that gift of writing. You know, I've written many sermons and I continue to write weekly. And I said, you know, this might be the time to write a book, but who am I gonna write this book to? And I wanna tell you, just like what God is doing here in our midst, God has given us a heart for these new people that are getting saved. How many of you just recently, within the last five years, gave your life to the Lord? Let me see you. Wow, look at that, beautiful. And I really said, God, what could we, what could we write that would not only benefit the people that are getting saved, but also benefit young people who are curious or leaders themselves who are curious about the process of becoming that person God has called them to be. So we printed out a little miniature copy here this morning. This is what the book is going to look like. It's called Rise Up Now. I've received a number of endorsements from friends and, and different ministers and different city people that I know, different relationships I've built throughout the years, endorsing the book. And it really is an exciting thing. And I hope and pray that the church, I hope you'll get behind it. Will you get behind it? Will you back it up? It's my first book. Our, 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 my publisher said, listen, if you sell 3,000 of these books, it'll be a bestseller on Amazon. And I said, okay, challenge accepted. So I know, Victor Arch San Diego, you're, you're down for at least 1,000 of these things. I think we could buy at least a thousand of these things. <laughs> and I have something special for you this morning because how many know we are raising funds for world missions? And this really is a labor of love. This, this book really is something that I really want to, I wrote for the people, I wrote for the church. I really want to help people. That's what I want to do. It's not about making money for me. It's about helping people, about getting some down, documented, that people can refer to year after year. I believe this, is, this book is going to be something you're going to keep in your library, you're going to refer to many times. I also talk about how I got saved and how me and Georgina met. So if you want to hear our love story, it's in this book. <laughs> Gives you a little background. People ask me all the time. But listen, I want to make it available uh, to you early. Someone say early. And even though it will be released nationally on October 15th, I want to release it to you uh, on September 23rd, I believe. It will be available. Now, Now, hold on, though. Uh, this is only for a group of you this morning because we are going to raise funds for Run for Hope. And how many of we have the auction tonight? So I'm going to auction one copy of the book for a million dollars. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. I feel like, man, pastors like the Wu-Tang Clan over here. Amen. No, I'm not going to do that. But what I am going to do is I want to make this book available to our church. Those of you this morning, and, and I, I encourage you to do it today or do it tomorrow, no later than Wednesday, because tomorrow I'm going to promote it online. But those of you who will sponsor your pastor $40 for Run for Hope. Now, once again, this money's not going in my pocket. It's not even going to the expenses of the book. It's going to world evangelism, because that's my heart. We're going to reach the world for Jesus. How many can say amen? So the proceeds are going to World Evangelism. Now, if you've already sponsored me 40 or more, guess what? you got a book coming. It's coming to you. Somebody's like, yes, I already got me in already. But I'm believing for 50 new sponsors for Run for Hope because, listen, guys, we're going to win Run for Hope. <laughs> we passed San Jose this morning. And we're only 20,000 or something behind Whittier. That ain't nothing, man. We, we raised 20,000 a week in this church. How many believe we're going to do it? 
so listen what a better way to reach the world and grow at the same time so i encourage you sponsor me i will receive the email that you sponsor me we will get your address we will make sure your copy is here at the church to be picked up on september 23rd and and we're going to make this available i'm looking for 50, the first 50 people amen now i have thousands of these but i'm, I'm going to give you and these are hard copies if you buy them online they're going to be soft covers so these are limited edition and the book is bigger than this this is a mini little version of it uh, it's bigger than this this is hand size so i could promote it it's small with the, it's a pot it's a small but it's got a big punch amen and uh sponsor me some of you sponsor me now i can see anna sponsored me already come on girl i can see you doing it people are already sponsoring me so your book is on the way amen and how many are excited about this project i think this is going to lift up our church it's going to lift up our people come on somebody how many can get excited praise the lord okay let's stand sponsor me today and your book will be on the way isaiah chapter six and keep me in prayer this is new for me guys this is a new territory for me and uh, sometimes i get nervous I, I don't like to promote myself but sometimes for these things you got to do it for the good amen okay isaiah chapter six and if you're watching online you can also sponsor me as well so um, that's available to you as well so if you're watching online you're watching on youtube this morning you'll receive a book on september 23rd book of isaiah chapter six when you have it say i got it this morning i want to minister a word i believe that there's a new season coming to our church i'm excited on wednesday we're going to start going into prayer again wednesday night how many feel like we need to go back and uh, that's going to happen starting this Wednesday. But this morning, I want you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. And when you got it, say, I got it. Okay, it reads like this. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried another to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the glory of the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken from the tongs from the altar. And how many know the altar is always on fire? It's always burning. He, he took it and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Look at here. And your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? For who will go for us? No, notice us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And look what Isaiah said. He said, here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. This morning, I want to speak a message to you. I believe it's a message in season entitled High Places in Hard Seasons high places in hard seasons. You, you may be seated this morning. Thank you very much. High places in hard seasons. This, this scripture is so rich. This story is rich. Some theologians refer to this portion of scripture as the gospel of Isaiah because it really is a, a story of good news. Someone say good news. And the good news of this story is the revelation and the message that Isaiah received. Now, I want to speak this message to you because I do realize that some of us go through hard times. How many of you go through hard times? And I've learned that life can present experiences that can take you down. Or these very same experiences can take you up. In the case of Isaiah, his tough experience didn't take him down. His, his tough experience took him up. And I've discovered that when hard times come, 
It's the spirit of God that leads me to a deeper revelation of God's word. And it's the spirit of God that leads me to a deeper revelation of his love and a deeper revelation of his power. I really think that this is a word for many this morning that have been facing trials and going through different situations this year. Because when you're going through those tough times, you can go in one of two directions. And what I really believe is that when tough times come, we really need a deeper revelation of God. In the, in the dictionary or in, if you study the word revelation, it's like an unveiling of something that's been hidden from your view. Everyone say revelation. A revelation is something that has never been seen before. A revelation is, is, is something that doesn't have to do with natural vision, but has something to do with spiritual vision. See, I believe that revelation is a heavenly vision given to us by God himself. And when God gives you a revelation, it not only opens up your eyes, it opens up your heart, it opens up your mind, and it opens up your life. I don't know who I'm speaking to this morning, but some of you, your Christianity, your walk with God has become stale, has become dead. And you know what you really need? You need a new revelation. You need a fresh encounter with God. You need a fresh touch of the Holy Ghost. Come on, give God praise if you agree with that word right there. Now, God doesn't want us to have any type of revelation. God has a specific revelation that he wants us to have. The story gives us background to the type of revelation God desires to give you and I in difficult times. To give you a little background, in the very beginning of the scripture, it says in the year that King Uzziah died. This is very important because many times we gloss over this portion of the scripture, but King Uzziah provides a, a, a backdrop in the story because King Uzziah was a very powerful and effective king who reigned in Judah for 52 years. That's a long time. He ruled that nation for 52 years, and he was very successful because this king, King Uzziah, he accomplished many, many great things for the people. He accomplished great things for the people politically, technologically, militarily, and even spiritually in advancing the kingdom towards their purpose. But the reason this is important is to know that here Isaiah, the prophet, and King Uzziah, they, they were good friends. They were good friends, and they were actually partners in doing the ministry of God. The prophet Isaiah, he, he happily served under the king, and he had a close relationship with the king. He had a relationship with him. He admired him. He loved the king, and he developed, watch this, a dependency on that relationship. He developed a strong dependency on that relationship. They were partners. But if you study the life of King Uzziah, you will find that even though he did many great things for the kingdom of God, at a certain point of his life, he became very proud. And because of his pride, the Lord removed the favor from his life. Who knows one Christian right now that has become proud? I want to tell you, man, that person needs to be careful because King Uzziah, he lost the favor. He crossed lines he shouldn't have crossed. He began to do things. He began to put his own strength above God's strength. And then he eventually died having lost that favor. What did it do to Isaiah? That being his friend, that being his co-worker in the ministry, it began to hurt Isaiah. In fact, I think even Isaiah felt somewhat complicit in walking in the flesh in walking in the natural, in depending on his own ability because he was so close to the king. And he saw that how the king, how he, how the king was blessed and how the king did great things. Isaiah, when the king died, was left alone. And now Isaiah is in fear because now that the king is dead, there's a power vacuum and the enemies of Israel are starting to march against Israel. They're starting to devour Israel's neighbors. So Isaiah feels all by himself. He has the loss of a great friend. He has the loss of a co-laborer and he's walking in an uncertain future. See, I want to say this to you. We all know this pain. We all know what it is to be serving God and have people in our life that once walked with us. 
that once served with us. I've been through this many times in my walk with God. I even go through it in the day now, even as pastoring. People that said, you know, I'm going to be with you. I got your back till the hubcaps fall off. And then something happens in their life and you feel all by yourself. We all know what it is to walk alone in the kingdom of God. We all know what it is to lose friends, to lose co-laborers, to lose brothers and sisters in the faith who became proud and allowed their strength to be stronger than God's strength in their life. Am I telling the truth this morning? I've experienced those times in my life. Those things happen. I've experienced projects that failed, people that have abandoned me. But what's the lesson that I want to share with you through this scripture right now is the lesson here is that the emotion of dying things should lead us to a renewed vision of a living God. I, like I said before, your difficult times can take you down or they could take you up. And what I want to say to some real Christians this morning, can I talk to some real Christians? Now, if you're not a real Christian, don't say nothing to me, but let me talk to those of you that are real Christians that you determine in your life you're going to serve God for the rest of your life. You're going to be faithful God to God for the rest of your life. Let me talk to you for a minute. People will walk away from you. Projects will fail. There will be tough times, but those problems can take you down or they can take you into a fresh vision, a new encounter with God, a new touch of the Holy Ghost. I've allowed those things not to take me out, but to take me in. For Isaiah, difficulty and loss drove him into a deeper revelation of God in his life. And what God actually did is he used this hard season to lead Isaiah to a high place. I feel like this word is going to take you to a high place. I feel like the word of God and this new season we're going into is going to take you to a high place. I believe that as we pray on Wednesday nights, you're going to go to a high place. I want to talk to a people that want to go to a high place this morning. See, I can't help but to think about the powerful eagle, the apex predator of the wilderness. See, when an ordinary bird is caught in a storm, most birds hide in the trees or take cover. But the eagle sets himself contrary to the winds. The eagle opens up those big wings. Are there any... Christian's here with some big wings. And he doesn't hide. He opens up those big wings. Instead of running from the wind, he goes into the wind. And as he goes into those contrary winds, it allows the eagle to rise higher than the storm. The stronger the winds, the higher the eagle begins to rise. I'll say it again. The stronger the winds, the higher the eagle begins to rise. Until that eagle rises above the storm. Some people say an eagle can fly up to one mile high. And it's there, watch this, where the eagle's safe from the storm. It's there where the eagle can rest his body, rest himself until the storm passes. See, friends, what am I saying is when we set ourselves against the winds of adversity. Adversity is going to come. Trouble is going to come. Conflict is going to come. Loss is going to come. Hardship is going to come. But when you set your wings against the winds of adversity, those adverse winds, they take you higher because they take you into prayer. Mm. They take you into fasting. They take you into a revelation with God, an encounter with God. I don't know what you're going through this morning, but all I know is that God wants you back on your knees. God wants you back in the spirit. God wants you back grateful. Like, I don't know what you're facing. I don't know if this is your first time or your thousandth time, but God wants you to go against the wind and to rise above the storm. He says, I've made a way for you. I've made a way through prayer. See, they take us to a new dimension with God. They take us to an intimate place. Sometimes God removes people from you because he wants to get along with you. Have you ever thought about that? He removes those things from you because he wants to get along with you. He wants to spend time with you. He wants to speak to you. He wants to show you something new. He wants to reveal a new plan, a new vision. Come on, somebody. It's a renewed vision of God in our lives. So here we see Isaiah rising above the clouds into the heavenly realm. It's in the scripture. You see it. Where Isaiah actually goes into the throne room of God. Isn't that heavy? Oh, man, what a revelation. 
Who, who's ever been there? I need to talk to you because I want to go there. <laughs> but we have access. And Isaiah goes right into the throne room. So what did God show Isaiah in his time of difficulty and change? The first thing is that Isaiah saw the majesty of God. The majesty of God. The Bible says this. It says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. Look at this. And the train of his robe filled the temple. What did Isaiah see? He saw God's majesty. When Isaiah entered into this dimension, which I believe was in the spirit, he saw the angels. He heard the angels singing. He felt the atmosphere of worship. How many, how many know worship creates an atmosphere? When you worship in church, when you worship in your home, when you worship in your car, when you worship in your heart, there's an environment that comes. And he felt the atmosphere of worship, and he saw also the holiness of God. This is the glory and the majesty of the Lord. The word majesty is defined as greatness or splendor in quality or character. Imagine how you feel if you're around someone important. When you're around someone important, don't you stiffen up your back? Don't you smile? Don't you, you know, straighten out your clothes, straighten out your tie? Why? Because majesty is character and strength and splendor and quality. It's authority, dignity, sovereign and power. What did God cause Isaiah to see? I believe this. I believe that God wanted Isaiah to see his sovereignty. He wanted Isaiah to see that God was God. God wanted Isaiah as a prophet, as a minister, as a leader in the nation to experience his strength one more time. He wanted to expose Isaiah. Look at this. He wanted an old revelation to become new again. I feel that's so important. I feel that's so right on right now. There's some of you that you've seen the Lord. You've seen his majesty. You've seen his sovereignty. Some of you haven't, but some of you have. And you've seen what God is able to do. But an old revelation needs to become a new revelation. Woo. Come on, somebody. An old revelation needs to become a new, a fresh revelation. A fresh encounter with God. I believe that the Lord allowed Isaiah to come in because he wanted to make something old new again. And you know the message to Isaiah was this. Watch this. This is so powerful. The message to Isaiah was, you know what, Isaiah? Uzziah might be dead, but I'm still on the throne. <laughs> that situation might be dead, but I'm still on the throne. That friend might have left you, but I'm still on the throne. That brother in the Lord might have fallen away, but I'm still on the throne. And I'm the God that gave Uzziah the power. And I'm the God that gave Israel the, the advancement. I'm the God that brought Israel out of the wilderness and took them through the promised land. And they defeated Jericho. And I'm the God that delivered them out of captivity. And if I did it then, I can do it again. All you need to have is a fresh revelation of what God is able to do. In you. Is there anybody here this morning that is remembering that it's God that gave you the power? It is God that is the deliverer. It is God that is the... Oh, God. I thank God for people, but people haven't gotten me to where I am today. It's been the Lord. It's been his favor. It's been his vision. It's been his call. Oh, my God. Touch your neighbor and say, it's the Lord, my brother. It's the Lord. Whew. He brought Isaiah up to that heavenly realm because he wanted to remind him of a few things. That you may have lost some things, but I'm still. <laughs> I'm still on the throne. I'm still sovereign. I'm omnipotent. I'm omniscient. I'm omnipresent. I'm immutable. All those are just fancy words to say, I'm all powerful and I never change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if I've done it before, don't you think I can do it again? I can part the Jordan again. I can part the Red Sea again. I can do another miracle in your life. Some of you have lost faith, but I came to tell you on a Sunday morning, God's not done with you yet. He's still on the throne. 
Wow. We need a fresh revelation. We need a fresh encounter. So the second thing Isaiah saw was not only the majesty of God, but Isaiah in his presence saw man's limitations. In verse 5, he said, woe is me, for I am undone. Look at this. Because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Think about that for a moment. Think about how you talk. Think about the words that come out of your mouth. Think about it. Think about the things you say. Wow. That this man who thought he was doing well to the presence of God and he, he starts to see everything he's been doing wrong. He starts to see how he talks and how he, what comes out of his mouth that he has. He doesn't speak words of faith. He doesn't speak positively. He doesn't give God glory for his goodness. There's a lot of things that we say that don't glorify the Lord. But how many want to start glorifying the Lord? See, when Isaiah got into the presence of a holy God, he couldn't help but to feel small. Understand that God uses people who feel small in his presence. And when Isaiah got into his presence, he couldn't help but to feel small. Look at this. Isaiah realized he was qualified to serve an earthly king, but he was totally unqualified to serve a heavenly king. See the perspective. He served the king. He was friends with the king. He said, look at me. Look how great I am. I'm able to stand next to the king. We're buddies. We text each other. We go places together. He takes my advice. I'm totally qualified to walk with him. But in the end, he was totally unqualified when he entered the presence of God. He realized in the presence of God, all his weaknesses we're exposed. That's why he wrote, our righteousness is as filthy rags. Our righteousness is nothing. There's so many Christians in the house of God that think there's something, but they're really nothing. They walk with such pride. They walk with such arrogance. They walk like know-it-alls. And it was in that moment where Isaiah realized, I might know a lot down there, but up here I know nothing. Because his ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. As high as the heavens are from the earth, as high as God is for me. Come on, somebody. Isaiah wrote these things. Why? Because he had a revelation of God. And when you have a revelation, a fresh revelation of God, you're going to see your frailty. You're going to see your weakness. You're going to see where you've gone wrong many times. You're going to see it. You're going to feel it. You're going to say, man... Even in preparing this message yesterday, I'm just going through changes the whole day as I'm letting this word soak into my heart. And I say, God, I can't preach this message. I have so many things wrong with me, so many things that I I need to change in my life. But the Lord said, preach it, because at least you see it. And as we begin to get into his presence, we realize that without God, we can do nothing. You still talk like that. You still preach like that. Do you still pray like that? Do you still walk like that? Or are you so good now? Oh, you're good. Aren't you so good? You're such a good person, a good leader. Oh, you're so good. Here's my tithe. You're so good. Do you still realize that without God, we are unable to do anything for his glory? We're unable to be effective without God. That's the heart of this message, man. We need God. We need God more than ever. So Isaiah saw his limitation. And here's the key. Is that with Isaiah, when you get a taste of God's presence and you realize you're nothing without him, watch this, you won't want to leave.
If you're proud, you want to leave. If you're conflicted, you want to leave. If you're vexed, you want to leave. Because you don't have a fresh revelation. But when you get into his presence and you really understand that you're nothing without him, you'll have a new hunger for his presence. I know the times that I've gotten into the presence of God like I did last Tuesday before we went to Yosemite. I got into the presence of God so strong. I was broken at my house. I had tears falling down my eyes the entire, probably for a good six hours all day. Just broken and thanking God for his miracles and thanking God for his faithfulness. And even though there's some people that walk away, there's still those that are experiencing miracles in their life. And I begin to say, Lord, thank you for that, Lord. And I was so broken and I got into that presence and I got into that place of power. And I said, I don't want to leave here. I didn't want to shut uh, Alexa off because she was bumping the worship sounds. And I said, Alexa, bring it higher, Alexa. Take it to another level, Alexa, because I'm in the presence of God and I am experiencing the anointing and I don't want to leave. I don't want to go to work this morning. I want to stay right here in the presence of the Holy Ghost because I need God every day of my life. I need God in my leadership. I need God in my marriage. I need God in my money. I need God in my children. I need God everywhere I go. I need to walk in the presence of God. I need to feel the power of God because without God, I can do nothing. Who agrees with that? When, when you see your weaknesses, you don't run from the house of God. You run to it. You don't run from the altar. You run to it. And the, and the, and the better you are. Cause some of you are good. You've gotten so good, boy. You've gotten so good in your preaching, so good in your music, so good in your Bible study, so good in your discipleship. Woo, you're good, look at you go. But the better you get, you better be careful. Because the more of God's presence you need. The more of God's presence you need. See, Isaiah thought that God was going to kick him out because he was so messed up. But here's the beauty of God. God didn't kick him out. God sent him an angel. And the angel took the tongs and he went to the altar and he pulled a coal. And that coal represents something. It represents cleansing. It represents the purity of fire. And he took that coal, watch this, and he touched those dirty lips with that coal. He touched those dirty lips with that coal. He took that fire. That's what God will do when you have an encounter with him. God is able to make dirty things clean again. Who feels like they need a coal this morning? And he would take that coal and he touched his lips. Come on, somebody. And he cleansed him. And he wiped away his sin. When you're in the presence of God, your only request is God, remove my sin. Remove my weaknesses. Remove. Make me clean again. And that's what God did. God didn't kick him out of his presence. God doesn't kick anybody out of his presence. We leave his presence. When John the Revelator spoke to the church of Ephesus, he says, you've left your first love. Your love didn't leave you. You left it. And I came to tell you, anyone who walks away from the presence of God is leaving God. God doesn't leave them. God simply says, if you want to be here, let me cleanse you. If you want to be here, let me wipe away your sin. If you want to be here, let me do what I'm able to do in your life. Let me do what the world can't do. Let me do what your job can't do. Let me do what your family can't do. Is anyone here grateful that the Lord cleansed you and gave you a new chance? This is powerful. You can be clean. You can walk clean. You can walk in the power of God. You can. You don't have to be in the flesh all the time. You don't have to talk like that. You choose to talk like that. You choose to live like that. 
you choose to do those dirty things. You can be clean this morning. You don't have to live a life of shame. You don't have to hide your sin. You don't have to be a closet sinner. You can come out of the closet this morning and be the real thing because there's coal at this altar and he can clean you and he can make you whole and he can give you his power and he can give you your... You don't got to be a hypocrite. You don't got to be a fake believer. You don't have to be a two-timer on God. You can serve God with all your heart. You can give him your whole life. You can be the real thing. He wants to cleanse you. He wants you in his presence. He's inviting you to come. Because thirdly, he wants you to get back on mission. Because the third thing Isaiah saw was not only the majesty of God and man's limitations, but lastly, he heard and saw the mission of heaven. He heard it. Imagine being in the throne room. This is heavy. And hearing God talk about his plans. That's why we're going to pray on Wednesday. Because we need to hear, God, what are your plans? I know my plan, but what are your plans? What are your plans for me? What are your plans for the ministry? What are your plans for my family, my life? Young people, you're busy, but you don't know his plan. And he gets into the throne room, and he hears the plan. This is good. Isn't it powerful? And he says, who will go for us? Who will go for us? See, Isaiah heard the mission. He heard the heavenly conversation. And when a person has a fresh revelation of God, things begin to change. I'm sure that once Isaiah went up, he began to look at the world differently. When you've been in the presence of God, the world looks different to you. When you've been in the presence of God, situations look different to you. When you've been in the presence of God, do you know that the world is less intimidating? <laughs> so many Christians walking around in fear. Shaking in anxiety. I need this. I need that. I'm scared. What's going to happen to me? The world is getting the best of you. The world is shaking you up. The world is because you're not spending enough time in the presence of God. Because when you get into the heavenly realm, the world doesn't scare you. The problems of this life don't scare you. Because you say, even if I die, is this too strong? Even if I die, I know where I'm going. It's the place that I long to be anyways. Fear not, says the Lord. When you've been in the presence of the Lord, the, Lord is, the world is less intimidating. The world is less stressful. The world has less power over your life. Money has less power. Stress has less power. Anxiety has less power. Listen, if you're going in, you shouldn't come out more stressed out. You should come out more peaceful. Because your eyes have seen the Lord. And if you really long to go there, you won't be stressed out. But if you hunger for this world, and you love to feed your flesh, and you love that, you love life itself. You love life itself. You love all the delicacies of this world. Then you better believe that when this world doesn't give you what you crave, you will suffer. You will suffer. And you will have pain in your body and pain in your heart. And pain in your spirit because this world is not delivering on a false promise. <laughs> you will suffer. And you know what? If you crave this world, you deserve to suffer. 
You deserve to suffer. That's what you deserve because that's what you desire. But I came to tell you, I want nothing this world has. I want to serve Jesus. I want to get to heaven. I've been praying, Lord, come back for us, man. I'm tired of it. I'm ready to go to heaven. I want to be in your presence for eternity. I want to move on to the next chapter. I want to move on. Is there anybody here that hungers for God? Hungers for the presence of the Holy Ghost? When you crave the Lord, the world doesn't scare you. You know why? Because we don't fear like the world fears and we don't live like the world lives and we're not vexed like the world's vexed and we don't cry like the world cries and we don't mourn like the world mourns. Yes, we mourn. Yes, we cry. Yes, we get stressed at times, but it's not like the world. We're humans and we go through problems and we go through pain in our life, but we don't do it like the world. We don't hurt people when we're in pain. We don't make people suffer when we're struggling. We know how to take it to the throne room of God. And then the Bible says he gives us the peace that surpasses all understanding. And he changes our vision and he changes our mood and he changes our spirit. Our trials don't take us down. Our trials take us up. Am I preaching? Is this making sense to you? When you get into his presence, as I close, you're going to hear the mission for your life. That's what some of you need. You know that it's only heaven that can put your dreams back together. The blood saves you. Preaching encourages you, but it's only heaven. Someone say heaven. It's only heaven that can put your dreams back together. If you have a broken dream, a broken heart, a broken vision, if you've lost something, just like Isaiah lost his best friend, 52 years. It was the vision of God that put his dream back together because when they said, whom shall we send? He said, ooh, here am I. Send me. For my eyes have seen the Lord, for I've received, look at this, a fresh revelation. I've seen your majesty, I've seen My frailties, I've seen where I've gone wrong, how I've walked in the flesh and I've followed a man and I didn't follow you. And my whole vision has shifted and I came to tell you, heaven will put your vision back together again. It will. says I'm supposed to be a prophet think about these things I'm supposed to be a prophet here I am Lord send me back to the nations here I am Lord send me back to do what you originally called me to do There's seven benefits of encountering God as you stand. Number one is a fresh and renewed vision from God. Number two is to see and understand your weakness and need for change. Number three, an encounter with God will allow you to deal with the issues that hold you back from his presence. Number four, you'll learn to serve God his way and not your way. Number five, you will hunger for more of his presence. You will linger in his house. Linger in his house. Number six, he will give you a powerful task to accomplish. And then lastly, look at this. He will give you great success and joy in all you do. That's what some of you have lost. You've lost your way. 
I was up on that mountaintop in Yosemite. I looked down. God says, some of my people have lost their way. I said, God, but I, God, I, I'm there. I'm modeling for them. I'm, I'm modeling for them, Lord. I work hard. I go to the office three to four days a week. I stay late hours. I preach as often as I can, sometimes even more than I should. I come to church on Sunday night. Some pastors don't even go to church on Sunday night. Or Wednesday night. I give. I have my offering in hand, Lord. I, I do all I can. He said, my people have lost their way. So how could they have lost their way, Lord, if I'm doing the best I can? He says, because they're following you, but they're not following me. Follow him. I can't bless you like him. I can't meet your need like him. You know what? In reality, I'm just like you. I'm just up here talking, but I really should be down there sitting. Because I'm not following you. I'm following him. Why do I come so much? Why do I preach so much? Why do I do all I do? I do it for him. Because man couldn't save me. People couldn't change me. Only God could do that miracle. Come on, somebody. Only God could do it. I believe there's some of you that have lost your way. But the good news is that God could put your vision back together. He could take that shattered dream and he could restore it. And if this message was for you, only if it was for you, and you want to make a commitment to get back into his presence, then I, I want you to come to this altar. And, and I want you to ask the Lord to really reveal himself to you. Reveal himself to you. And really begin to show you where you've lost your way. And begin to put that, that dream back together again. Put that vision back together again. Come on up. Come on up and just begin to talk to him if you know how to pray. Begin to talk to him. Let, let, raise your voice to the Lord. He's going to take that coal. And he's going to put it, touch your lips. And he's going to wipe away your iniquity and your sin. And he's going to give you a fresh start this week. He's going to begin to reveal to you his plan, not yours, his plan. So that way you don't have to fight in vain and work in vain and labor in vain.